You know, I took being in time with me on uh, my Christmas traveling. And so I was, in fact, sitting around in a, a doctor's office for a while where my mom was being treated. And I was with my sister and my dad and her. And, and I was reading some of being in time aloud <laughs> to intelligent people who are not philosophy people. And they made me stop. <laughs> And very, very soon, because, and the, this is the reason I'm saying this now, because it's like it was taking him so long and circumspectly and putting in all these difficult words to say, like, what a hammer is. <laughs> and I can just, I picture people listening to this and saying, okay, Seth has now said for the third time, yeah, we have goals. We're concerned with things. Like, really? You had to write a book to... No, 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 no. Again, we started with the question of being, but it's very hard to see how this stuff that he's talking really addresses what the question of being is, other than, oh, if you think everything's a substance and you treat us as things, then you're missing this stuff. You need to take a more humanistic approach to these kind of things. But he does way more than that. He goes out of his way to sort of slide all these really everyday observations that you're talking about into this ontological terminology and to root it historically so that you could see, you know, if you look at the Greek derivation of, you know, the notion of truth or whatever and go back in time, then you'll see that, ah, oh, okay, these ways that Descartes and Kant were talking about it were wrong and we need to get at this more fundamental thing, which lets us see what's right in front of our face all the time. The fact that things are equipment, for instance, that should be obvious to us, but no philosopher before Heidegger has ever thematized it, has ever made this a theme for ontology because it's just too close for us. We have to somehow back off to be able to see the obvious. One of the parallels he gives is, you know, the glasses on your face, even though those could be ontically the closest possible thing to you. In other words, the glasses are right there on your face, but ontologically is extremely far from us because it's really hard for us to focus on it and grasp its true significance or to realize it's even there. So I guess I just in one speech said, this sounds useless, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got confused there. Listen, Mark, I agree with you. I mean, I think probably when he wrote this book, this is a really radical thing to say within philosophy, right? If you tell somebody, nobody who's listening to this podcast, who's a normal human being is going to be like, wow, I just learned something about human nature. But for Heidegger to say, we have been screwing up ontology and we've been engaged in this misguided activity called metaphysics for hundreds and hundreds of years just because we're overlooking this. And I'm trying to raise the fact that we need to turn around and look at it. And he's trying to draw attention to it and say, OK, if it were the case that this is a fundamental part, this is a way of being of Dasein. What is that ultimately going to mean for ontology? He says, you know, that this is just preparatory, blah, blah, blah. And he ends up throwing away the project of trying to do being in time. He never finishes it, right? So maybe he realized what you're pointing out, which is he was right. It is somehow critical to doing ontology, but there's no way to thematically get to it by doing some sort of big exposition or whatever, which is why in the later part of his life, he spends time reading these poets and talking about architecture and stuff like that. And this is a, another reason why I think he gets criticized, right? There are a lot of people who are like, well, he just took this idea from so-and-so. Like, this is an amalgamation of Kant, Hegel, Descartes, Husserl, Kierkegaard, Schopenhauer, Brentano, and Diltai. And he's just kind of brought them all together, and he never actually... He didn't create anything new, and he never actually accomplishes the goal he brings all these people together to do. That's certainly one interpretation of this. At the same time, he had such a profound influence on so many people... And there were lots of people who clearly saw that he was right to criticize the project of Western metaphysics. And he sort of mainstreamed existentialism in a way that Kierkegaard hadn't, I don't think, and also provided a context for all of this other stuff. He's on to something. Yeah, maybe we could try and say what that, because I don't know that I fully understand the critique of metaphysics of Descartes and, and the rest, because just saying that, well, you've been wasting your time <laughs> with the subject object distinction, it doesn't, that in itself isn't persuasive to me, but let me try and get at my understanding of this. And you guys should say something about what he's actually done, you know, that's revolutionary with regard to metaphysics. But as I take it, the introduction of this, let's say category of care as being fundamental, I could see Kant coming back and saying, well, 
okay, that's great. You want to do sociology and history and empirical psychology. Those are great disciplines, but that's not philosophy, right? And you might see care as something that comes after, you know, Kant is concerned with how do we ground objectivity and what are the grounds for the possibility of experience and so on and so forth. And he gives all those cognitive categories and he might say something like, something like care isn't fundamental to that and emotions and all sorts of other things are an issue mm -hmm. for empirical psychology. They're not really fundamental to subjectivity as such, and they don't really do anything for objectivity. But if I understand what Heidegger's response might be, it's that, well, actually care is integral to being. It's not just an add on. It's a sort of an accidental part of consciousness that comes after you've established objectivity. It's down there in the guts. It's fundamental. It is something that you can't do without. Kant loves that phrase, grounds for the possibility of experience. Well, it's one of those grounds of experience and being as such. That's something I have to think about more, but that's the way I understand right now what he's doing that's modifying the traditional metaphysics and epistemology. Right. That's a fundamental part of Dasein's being, right? Just to be clarified, care, again, is a technical term which has to do with our engagement with the world for purposes. And you could say, well, there are lots of times when I don't have a particular purpose or whatever. And uh, Heidegger seems to characterize times like that of like, oh, no, no, you're still fundamentally in the mode of care. You're just in a deficient <laughs> appearance of the mode or something like that. Yeah, I didn't. I don't like that. I hear what you're saying. I think an easier to understand one is with people, that we are fundamentally being with others. Well, what if you're on an island? No, you're still fundamentally being with others because you're a social creature. You think in terms of, you know, if you actually were dropped as a baby on the island and never saw another person, then, okay, you wouldn't have that fundamental being with as Dasein. But the fact that you were socialized at all means that you are in the ontological mode of being with, even if you're not physically with anyone. And it's the same thing. So you're in the ontological yeah. mode of care, even if you don't give a crap about anyone and you don't have any particular goals and you're just a slacker. Just to go back to the contrast, right? So for Kant, Kant's interested in causality. I just want to compare causality and care. And maybe that's helpful. For Kant, there's no such thing as objects without causality, and there's no such thing as experience without causality. Something like care never comes into that picture. You know, that never grounds what it means to be an object mm -hmm. or an experiencer. You could do without it. It's accidental. It's nowhere there in what's essential to being a subject or an object. And I know to so get to Heidegger, it's not subject object exactly, but you could say that if you thought causality is in some way foundational to being for Kant and care is accidental with Heidegger, it seems like the revolutionary thing is to say, well, no, it's actually foundational. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as being without that. Well, and what does foundational mean? Because that's, yeah, the, that's the key. It's, it's to <laughs> redefine what foundational means is to say that instead of what's basic is substances and you can kind of build those up. And eventually, if you get into empirical psychology, you can talk about people having purposes and they have mental things. And maybe yeah. we want to reduce those to talk of physical things and maybe we don't. But in any case, that's the overall ontological picture. No, no, mm -hmm. no. That's not taking the fact that we start from our own point of view seriously. We need to start right. from our own point of view where things are meaningful. They just are meaningful. We don't, if you say, really, we just experience sense data or these physical objects and we add meaning to them, that's just a bullshit theory that you're imposing on the phenomena. What the phenomena tell us is that things are meaningful, that we are engaged with things yep. in this care relationship fundamentally. And in fact, it's an abstraction to mm -hmm. get to the kind of things that empirical science talks about. Like his, uh, yep, I think that's a great way of putting it. Like this account of uh, space, the fact that, you know, you think the space of Euclid, uh, you know, that's the fundamental thing. And that's kind of the way Kant talks about it is, is that just, you know, to have any experience at all, we have to experience it in towards using this three dimensional going to infinity in every direction. There's uniform distances and you can count them in every direction. No, but for Heidegger, the world that we live in, the space that we live in has to include a here and a mm -hmm. yonder and its distances are not what you measure with a ruler, but it's kind of how far away is something? Well, how long is it going to take you to get there? How much trouble is it to get there? Mm -hmm. And we can abstract away from all our particular purposes and just take out a ruler and measure things. But we got to understand that that's derivative. That's just a partial representation of the world. The world in itself mm -hmm. has all these meanings in it, these human things fundamentally. Yes. Nice. That's very well put, Mark. And the only other piece to add to that is not just space, but time. 
Mm. We have the exact same thing with time. And that is a critical, fundamental part of being, the Dasein, is temporality. Just as we saw, I think, in Husserl and also in Schopenhauer, the idea that temporality is fundamental to being. And I like Husserl's image of it, that you can analyze experience into these what he calls these egological layers that you can talk about. Yeah, okay, I can talk about the physical properties of what's in front of me. I can talk about the anticipations that I have of other, the fact that I'm looking at this book and I anticipate that it has a back. I can also talk about the social layers of meaning, the fact that I perceive it as a book and not as a physical object that's this tall with a certain bumps or whatever. The fact that I understand not only that it has pieces of paper in it, but what those are for and the fact that, you know, somebody wrote it and somebody printed it and all this stuff that, you know, these layers of meaning, I guess it wasn't clear to me from the Husserl and I don't know what he really thinks about this, which ones are basic, which ones are primordial in some ways. I mean, the only way to figure that out is just look at the phenomena themselves. Certainly, that's what Heidegger is doing here. He's looking at that phenomenon and saying, okay, then, yeah, the meaning ones, those are the primordial ones. The fact that it is a book, because when you actually think about how we deal with a book, when we're not engaging in explicit theorizing or, or phenomenological exploration, we understand that that's how we see it first, right? As a book, not as a doorstop or something, you know. Mm-hmm. But then I think back to our Nelson Goodman conception, which is Nelson Goodman's idea would be to say, look, you could come up with a world, he would call it, that counts any one of these layers as basic. And you could use that world for certain purposes. So if you don't like the world, you could throw it away and use something else. But you could say, okay, for the purposes of natural science, we're going to take the physical properties as basic. For the purposes of literary criticism, we're going to take the fact that it's a book as basic. And Neither of those is really more fundamental than any other. It just depends on what your purpose is for it. And the fact that Heidegger is stressing that, oh, the world is not atomic. The world is holistic. Well, again, somebody like Goodman can say it's atomic for certain purposes. It's holistic for other purposes. If you're considering these kind of analyses that Heidegger has been giving, yes, okay, then his ontology makes sense for that. But don't call one of these the basic ontology and one of these derivative. There's no justification for that. Yeah, I, hear, I, I hear Seth sighing here. No, no, I, I don't think that's... So I get where that criticism is coming from, and I would respond to it this way. I think what Heidegger would say is there are multitudes of activities that we engage in where we create what Goodman would call a world. We use objects or we act in such ways that we narrow the scope and make some kind of activity or some sort of disposition primary. But it's still fundamental to human activity or Dasein that we do things, we care about what we're doing or don't care about it, and we have reasons for why we're doing those things. That's the fundamental stuff that's there. And if you say, oh, well, I'm going to go to the gym and work out because I want to get healthy, because I want to live a long life, and you prioritize that, and I prioritize cigar smoking and eating red meat and drinking wine, we're still both fundamentally engaged in activities that we have a certain disposition toward and we have a future state, a future goal that we're trying to achieve. That structure is the fundamental structure. There's nothing beneath that, so to speak. You can't not do anything. You can't not act because even not to act is still, is it you know, it's still fundamentally of part of human. Yes. Since what it's so obvious that care as he's defining it is such a central part of us, you know, it's hard to argue with that. But if you look at the way that mode of argumentation that you just gave, that if it looks like there's a contrary, then you just say it's a deficient mode of, of, or it presupposes by its negation, the thing that you're arguing against. So I, you know, I really think that everybody is all about prairie dogs. You might deny that everybody's about prairie dogs, but the fact that you're denying that, it like presupposes the prairie dogness of things. How could you, you're denied. Do you see what I'm t- saying? It's a, it's a bullshit I, I form do. of argument. No, I, <laughs> I, but this isn't intended to be an argument. It's intended to, I mean, I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. If you're a human being and you say, I'm not going to do anything, that doesn't change your essential nature from a thing that acts to a thing that doesn't act. In fact, you are acting. You are acting by not acting. Do you get what I mean? 
Sure. That's what I'm trying to say. That's not an argument. It's I'm just trying to point out that as a human being, you can't choose not to be an active entity with dispositions towards things. It's not possible. So does that sound like it's your essence? So in other words, he's not an existentialist. This is our essence to be active beings. We oh, can't he's, say he's, that. he's not an existentialist the way Sartre is. Yes. No, this is what we talked about earlier. No. But we didn't fill it out because it actually says in being in time here in the part we read, our existence is prior <laughs> yeah. to our essence and we don't really have an. And you could see, so Dreyfus characterizes all of Sartre's being nothingness as a misreading of being in time, that his emphasis on uh, the fact that Heiger gives all this setup for what sounds like existentialist, you know, you choose your own being and you push yourself in different directions and... Uh, the way he talks about emotions is ontological. All this stuff comes out in Sartre. But I guess uh, Heidegger didn't actually believe any of that or else he wouldn't have been such a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> no. Did you see the uh, YouTube video clip of Dreyfus being interviewed by Brian McGee that, that no, I will, Daniel put up? No, I will up? watch it. He spends like, I don't know, five minutes talking about Husserl and then the rest of the five clips are almost all about Heidegger. But Dreyfus went to visit Heidegger, he mentions in this video, and apparently being in nothingness was sitting on the table. And Dreyfus said, oh, you're reading Being in Nothingness. And Heidegger said, I can't read that crap. <laughs> <laughs> Literally used the German word dreck, which means crap. So just to get back to your point, I don't think Heidegger would agree with Sartre on that point. So where are we? How are we doing with the question of being? Yeah, well, we'll never get to the question of being because all we're doing is spelling <laughs> out the being of Dasein in this thing. We already said a lot about, at least by example, how his way of uh, doing phenomenological examination is different from Husserl's, which I, I always find it hard to characterize this because it just seems like, okay, Husserl has this very well-defined epoche and things. Heidegger thinks that doesn't work. And so what's his alternative? Well... Oh, I'm analyzing the history of philosophy and the history of how words were used to try to get at what people meant by being. I mean, it really all comes down to being, whereas Husserl's phenomenology is really open to the full. This is just how Heidegger characterizes it himself, at least in one place. But it seems like Husserl's phenomenology is open to the full range of human experience, even though he himself focuses mostly on perception. But other folks like Sartre talk about other parts of experience. But Heidegger's is really, oh, no, no, phenomenology is all about getting the underlying being of things. Or, sorry, of what being is apart from beings, the being that beings have, right? And that has to do with what he thinks phenomena are. I don't even know that most people would even call what he's doing phenomenology. It's certainly not phenomenology like Husserl intended, which is why Husserl backed away and from the book after it was published. Heidegger basically says, look, I want to answer this question, what is the meaning of being? In order to answer the question, what is the meaning of being? I can only look at beings because there's no such thing as being out there that I can study. So I'm going to look at beings. Well, the best way to look at beings is not to take a scientific approach or a, an analytic of the sort that Kant does. The best thing to do is to look at how things actually are in the world. Look at how the world is. Look at how the world presents itself. Look at the phenomena. Right. You know, presents he does, itself. There have been people who said that his uh, etymology is very spurious. Uh, I'll leave it to West to judge. But his conception of phenomenology, he's trying to reach back to this Greek use of the term. He thought the Greeks had a way of thinking about things where they allowed them to present themselves to people as they were in themselves. He thinks that objectivity and the form of the you know ideas in Plato, all that stuff we talked about, substances, objects, ideas, these things change the way that we see the world. And having a theoretical structure in place prevents us, so to speak, from seeing things as they are in themselves. Mm -hmm. And his intention, what he thinks phenomenology is, is that it's going to allow things to show themselves as they are in themselves and not through some kind of lens. So this whole existential analytic of Dasein is intended to be an exercise in letting it show itself, which is why it sounds, why the wording is so weird and why he's got all this Greek and you know, he thought that German was the only true heir as an expressive language to Greek, which is yet more of, you know, his naivete and his nationalism and all this stuff well, that, some, that came out. there's some argument for that. But. 
I don't disagree, but it's ridiculously arrogant and stupid yeah. to say that the language I speak is the best language for philosophy. You know, I mean, it's just, come on. Well, any language where you can simply run together words to make a new word is, <laughs> is inherently yeah. philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> so phenomenology for Husserl, it was a methodology and it was a methodology that was intended to be scientific. And what Heidegger's trying to do with phenomenology here is tease out meaning you know, he mentions hermeneutics and hermeneutics is originally a way of textual interpretation that was intended to tease out meaning. And it goes way, way, way back, right? There's biblical hermeneutics. And I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's well established. And Heidegger was doing a form of philosophical hermeneutics, which is why he plays around with language and looks at old Greek and Latin terms and the roots of words. And he's trying to get to an understanding that is not necessarily scientific. You mentioned the way he analyzes the ancient Greek being suspect. I don't think it's suspects, but I think it's, it reminds me exactly what I was doing when I was studying ancient Greek and I was very excited and I saw it as this sort of portal to things you couldn't think about otherwise. And there's a free association element that goes on, right? The way he, you use the ancient language to think about things differently. When I say Heideggerian call for St. John's, it's not like we studied Heidegger. It's that the whole reverent attitude towards the ancient Greeks was there and the whole approach and this looking at the ancient language in this way. It's not like he's giving a, a strict analysis of finest thigh in the ancient Greek. I think he's free associating to get ideas out of it, which at the same time, on the one hand, I was irritated a little bit because I have a little bit of bitterness about <laughs> my level of reverence it's like it's like someone who's been religious and who's no longer religious that's sort of my relationship to that <laughs> type of you know that was going to be my life and and to be a that kind of philosopher was going to be my life so i have that like anyone who's had a sort of faith and is disillusioned i have that bitterness towards it but on the other hand i think it's useful to look at language in that way and i've actually you know i enjoyed uh like reading heidegger is really shocking just because i'd never seriously read him and it's shocking in the sense of how much of this i was exposed to indirectly through my study of the ancient greeks and the environment that i did it in i think people that haven't read any of this are probably scratching their heads right now because we haven't given any examples we're not going to go through the etymological details but for instance when he decides what phenomenology means he says oh you know there's there's the phenom and there's the logos and then he talks about the ancient greek meaning to these words and how this really should tell us what phenomenology should be as opposed to say what Husserl said it was. So like, I think for the phenom part, it has to do, oh, in the ancient Greek, it had something to do with rising up, the emergence, the birth of something. Or is that the analysis of being? I might be confusing my- No, but your, your point is correct. So first off, for anybody who hasn't seen the text, all of the Greek is actually in the Greek alphabet. It's all these long, <laughs> these words and sentences in the Greek lettering. So if you can't read Greek, it won't do you any good. It, but it, it his, translates it in the back, in the end notes. Hmm. Anyway. There's too much work to flip to the back. <laughs> Didn't occur to me. But he does things like he says, oh, well, phenomenology is comes from the two Greek words phenomenon and logos. And, and then he talks about the root of phenomenon is phagon or whatever, Fine, which huh? means to rise up or to appear in itself, you know, that kind of thing. So he tries to break things down to these root meanings and then say, oh, you know, the original meaning of phenomenon was... A thing which shows itself in itself as it appears to, uh, you know, like these long, <laughs> and he tries to tease the meaning out that way. There are disagreements about whether or not certain words come from certain roots and what those roots actually mean and all that. And so there are a lot of people that criticize Heidegger because he does a lot of that stuff in his later writings. Lots and lots of yes. playing around with language. And that's what annoys the shit out of most Anglo-American philosophers and what delighted the French. And it also annoys them because he's making a very anti-analytical point with all of that. And his analysis of logos, logos does not mean judgment, he says. And he'll get to the point where he talks about discourse Logos mm -hmm. as discourse, as letting something be seen. And it sounds kind of touchy-feely in the end and quasi-mystical, but he wants to talk about Logos instead of his judgment as this letting something being seen. And that and all the talk of getting back to the pre-Socratics and being... I can see the irritation with that, you know? I mean, I feel some of that. I'm attracted to it at the same time that I'm irritated by it. You're a self-hating classicist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Exactly. It goes along with his conservatism, his provincialism or mm-hmm. whatever. I, I think it was in the introduction of metaphysics lecture that I was reading the beginning of that he was saying something like, there's no progress. He just kind of says this out of, out of nowhere. Like things start great and then they get crummier and crummier. And that's just the way things work. And that's the way you should expect them to work. The specific application to this in particular is when people come up with these words, these, those first philosophers, these people before Socrates, they were in touch with the phenomena themselves. But then once their words harden into doctrine and they are passed on to the next person, then it kind of gets more and more obscured and false as it's passed down. And so that's what he's doing, that we need to unravel the history of these things to figure out what the phenomena were that really the originals we're reacting to what's the grain of truth that's hidden in all these centuries of increasing error yeah and it, it sounds almost like a christian conception of the fall right and uh uh-huh. salvation and it's not works that's going to get you there it's faith or it's not science and judgment and the analytical approach that's going to get you there but it's this being receptive to the uncovering or something like that Right. The uncovering, that's the part of the phenomenon that I wanted to point out, that yeah. this is how he's different from Husserl. And this is, a, again, I mentioned what, what Fritjof Bergman just hated about him, that his whole thing of like what was great about continental philosophy, starting with Hegel, is there's no thing in itself lurking behind the appearances. We are connected in knowledge with the things in themselves. There is nothing beyond that. Or the, the things themselves, just to yeah, the things be more themselves. careful about you. Yes, even though Heidegger, you know, we've already characterized that, yes, is our being in the world means we are interacting with the world, not with our own appearances. So it seems like Heidegger has a hold of that. But at the same time, she talks about phenomena as it's not the appearances, it's the thing behind the appearances that appears. And these are both parts of experience broadly construed. But as you say, it's letting the things appear as themselves That some things, they appear as something else. In other words, they give a a false impression so that when you dig deeper, you'll see. Yes. So he he goes through these different, in his analysis of the phenomenon of these different ways we use the word appearance and how that's all very confusing. But ultimately, what it's going to come down to is that any of these significant truths are veiled. They're hidden, just like the glasses on our face or the way that we use tools unreflectively or our fundamental uh, being toward the world. Since as soon as we theorize about them, they're hidden by these theories and things, by the history of philosophy that's already weighing down on us, just by our ordinary attitude towards the world. Just the fact that we tend to treat things as objects. And so we want to treat ourselves as objects too. Like there's just all these things built in from various levels that will obscure the truth from us. So phenomenology is letting that which is veiled come forth and be analyzed and very non husserly Yeah. And the way he talks about it, it makes it sound like language is that veil, right? And I think we're talking about the introduction, part two, a, the concept of phenomenon, just for listeners. Uh-huh. Section yep. margin pages 29 and onwards. It's as if the signifier, whatever symbols being used is the thing that immediately shows itself to the senses, right? And the concept is not a seen thing. So it's something we've talked about before with language. What's signified is not is not a image or it's not a an object of the senses. And so it sort of remains unseen. Mm-hmm. So automatically, this sort of discursive way of talking about things sets up this opposition between that which shows itself in itself and then the not showing itself. Right. Which I take to be something conceptual. This was a useful thing that it points at, I think, ultimately what I at least got out of the lectures as being his view of truth. And ultimately, we still haven't talked about what, you know, what being as opposed to these different modes of being is. And at least one of the ways that Dreyfus kind of guesses at it based on a couple comments that Heidegger makes in here is that it's intelligibility which is just the same thing as I've been saying is, oh, you know, he's all doing ontology as related to people as opposed to ontology, the world in itself or something. You know, we have to start from our own perspective. And so if you have to say what being, capital B, is, at least one of the ideas that Dreyfus toys with, he ends up not liking this, not thinking that that's exactly right, but is that it's just how we can understand things, their intelligibility to us. So that explains like why ready to hand and presence to hand could be modes of being. These are just ways that we can understand objects in our relation toward them. Or again, I shouldn't even use that word objects, but the phenomena. You can see by this term phenomena, the way he's using it is they're not just the appearances, 
or even like Husserl talked about them, these appearances that include transcendence within them. I mean, Heidegger says some mm -hmm. similar things to that, but he doesn't mean it in exactly the same way as Husserl's talk of, you know, every physical object has horizons of other potential appearances. That's not all there is to transcendence. 